Uh, hi, I'm Jason Wright. I'm a professor at Penn State University. I'm excited to be at my first Sagan Summer Workshop. Uh, I'm going to be talking about RV planet signal fitting. So the idea is at this point, you've built your instrument, you've measured your wonderfully precise radial velocities, you subtracted off the motion of the telescope, and you have one of these radial velocity time series that uh, we'll be playing with in the hands-on workshop. And uh, there's a signal in there. And so the question is, what model are you going to use to fit the signal and extract the information about the orbital parameters of the exoplanet? So that's what we'll be talking about. And um, this is an old problem. What is the radial velocity signature of a body orbiting another body? And so um, this is kind of an evergreen talk. The other talks were all very cutting edge, but this one's old. And I actually dug up a bunch of old slides from my grad school days and plots from my grad school days because they're still you know, completely correct. Um, so we start with Kepler's laws. Um, the first one says that planets orbit the sun in an ellipse. Uh, and so that means that we expect orbits to have a semi-major axis and an eccentricity. So I've just plotted a few up for scale so we can get a sense of what the eccentricity looks like. E0 refers to a pur purely circular orbit. And E of 0.9, which is very extreme for an exoplanet, only a very small handful have eccentricities beyond 0.9 is elongated the way that I've shown there. The semi-major axis is half of the distance from uh, ap helion or ap astron, the farthest point, to peri astron, the closest point. And of course, we'd like to know that because that tells us about the temperature of the planet. So we're going to need to do some geometry here to visualize the uh, orbit in three dimensions and connect that to the radial velocities that we've measured. So um, the first thing is orientation here. Here, um, little m in the upper left there is the planet that's going around. Uh, and it's making an orbit. Uh, and this is what we would call an edge on orbit. The observer, Earth, is up in this figure. And the plane of the sky cuts through your screen. So this is a, an, uh, an edge on orbit where little m is going around uh, big M, the star, uh, and will occasionally transit big M when it lines up with that arrow there that says to observer. Now, um, little m, the planet, has an eccentric orbit that you can see there. And periastron uh, is the closest point to, to the center of mass there. And that's measured with respect to the plane of the sky by this angle little omega. So little omega, it's confusing in the literature. People are inconsistent about whether it refers to the star's orbit or the planet's orbit, which has to do with an old sign convention that's never been resolved. Um, but we all agree, no matter what convention you're using, that when little omega is 90 degrees, that means that the planet will transit the star, if it transits the star, uh, at periastron, at its closest approach. So the geometry here uh, is right. Um, now, the, we're not measuring the planet, of course. This is important to remember. We, we don't see the planet with precise radial velocities. We're not measuring its radial velocities. We're measuring the star's radial velocities. So Newton tells us that the star itself is doing its own little counter orbit. The orbit is a point reflection of the planet's orbit. So when we infer the star's orbital parameters, those are the same as the planet's orbital parameters, except for this annoying ambiguity with little omega. Um, so, uh, so it's little m, that's, it's big M, that's doing the motion that we're actually measuring, but it's little m whose orbit we are inferring. So if we want to know what the radial velocity is of big M, we have to know where it is in the orbit at a given time. And so we measure that with nu, the true anomaly, uh, which is just how far in its orbit the planet, or the star, uh, has orbited since periastron, which is measured from the plane of the sky by big mega. Now, unfortunately, this gets a little hairy because the true anomaly does not vary uniformly with time. When the planet is closer to the star, by Kepler's second law, it moves faster. So nu moves non-uniformly in time. And that was the big puzzle that Kepler solved um, and that we have to solve if we're going to build a radial velocity model to fit our data. So we do this with what's called Kepler's equation. Um, Kepler, to get from the time to the true anomaly, used two intermediate variables, the mean anomaly and the eccentric anomaly, through these two equations. And Kepler's equation, um, you'll see, is nonlinear. Uh, you have to solve it iteratively. There are some very fast algorithms. I use the Danby algorithm. It usually converges in two or three tries. So um, you can do it quickly, but in many orbit fitting software, it's actually the, um, it's actually the bottleneck if you're doing a huge number of these. So 
time flows uniformly, we like that, and we convert that to, a, uh, to an angle called the mean anomaly here in that first equation. So the time since periastron passage uh, is just linear in time. We convert it to an angle by dividing by the period and multiplying by 2 pi. So the mean anomaly is 0 at peri passage. It's pi uh, at astron. And it's, uh, and it's 2 pi when we get back to periastron passage again. So this is equal to uh, a function of this second intermediate variable called the eccentric anomaly, e equals the x or e minus the eccentricity times the sine of e. Um, if you solve that nonlinear equation given a time and a period and a periastron passage time for e, the eccentric anomaly, you can then convert that to the true anomaly with this second equation down below. So that's the method. Um, this means that your model needs to know the time of periastron passage and the period so that you can do this conversion. And here, we said before we wanted to get the um, size of the orbit, the semi-major axis of the orbit from the radial velocity curve, and we do that through the period. So this is where the period enters the model. Um, and down at the bottom there, we have Kepler's third law, which connects the period that we measure to the semi-major axis of the orbit via the masses of the star and the planet. Um, and so that's um, uh, um, the, the period squared uh, in years times the sum of the masses measured in solar units, solar masses, is equal to the semi-major axis in astronomical units. Okay, so we've now learned how to turn time into a true anomaly. Given some orbital parameters, what does it look like? This is your model. So when you've got your RV time series and you're fitting a model, this is the model. So let's break it down. On the left, we've got the radial velocity that we'd like to measure. It is equal to, uh, first of all, k. This is the amplitude of the signal we're looking for. So very massive planets close in have very large amplitudes, and we'll see that that's proportional to the mass of the planet later. But here, it's just got units of meters a second, and it's the amplitude of the signal. We multiply that amplitude uh, by uh, a, a cosine of the true anomaly plus the longitude of periastron. Um, Remember, though, that nu is not varying uniformly with time because it's an eccentric orbit. So this is a cosine of a function that doesn't vary uniformly in time. We then have a constant e times cosine omega. Uh, and then afterwards, we have this gamma function, or this gamma, which is just an overall RV offset. Now, if we were doing absolute radial velocities, this would represent the bulk motion of the entire system towards or away from Earth the center of mass of the, of the star planet system. Um, we aren't doing that though. And so in practice, this is just an arbitrary RV offset that has to do with the instrument that you're using. Uh, even if you think you have a pretty accurate measurement of that number, you don't know it nearly as precisely as you know the changes in the velocity from your EPRV measurements. And so in practice, this is just a nuisance term uh, and it'll be different for every instrument. Uh, so if you combine two telescopes, data together, uh, each one will have its own gamma value in practice. Okay, so what does this look like? Um, here I've made a plot of all of the different waveforms that you can get from this function. Uh, I've normalized all the periods to one and all of the amplitudes uh, to one here. So the, the left column of four RV curves that you can see is for E equals zero circular orbits. And so in a circular orbit, the true anomaly goes uniformly with time because there's no eccentricity. So you just have a cosine and that's what you see. And you can see as you change omega, the orientation of that orbit, um, you just change the phase of the cosine at fixed um, time of periastron passage. Um, and in fact, for a circular orbit, there's a total degeneracy between periastron passage time and this angle. Now we go to E equals 0.3 and you can start to see what the eccentricity is doing. When the planet is close to the star, it moves faster. And so we kind of go through the cosine faster and the peak doesn't last as long. And so it gets peakier. Um, and then if we change the orientation of that orbit, which phase of the orbit, whether RV maximum or minimum or somewhere in between is going faster changes just from our perspective. And so you can see as we step through omega 0, 30, 60, 90, what happens to that? And down at the bottom, it kind of looks more like a sawtooth. By the way, you can 
absolutely increase omega down to 180 uh, and beyond. That just that just flips. Um, it just reflects these curves either um, along the vertical or the horizontal axis. So this is just the first quadrant of omega. Um, but you just do reflections and you can get all of the others. So as we go to much higher eccentricity, say 0.9 on the right, uh, you can see all of the action really starts happening at Perry. And the rest of the time, there's very little going on. And so for very eccentric planets like 0.9, it can actually be tricky to catch them. You might think you have nothing there unless you were lucky enough to observe during Perry Astron. But like I said, most planets don't get that eccentric. Um, 0.6 is kind of the high end of what we generally see for giant planets. Uh, and you basically always have something going on. So it's not a really big um, selection effect against detection in general. So that's it. That's the model. Um, so let's count up how many free parameters we have and think about them for a minute. We have to know right here from the model, the argument of periastron. We have to know the eccentricity. We, uh, we have to know the semi-amplitude. We're fitting for all of these things. The RV zero point gamma. Uh, and then in order to have the true anomaly from the time, we also need to know the time of peri passage and the period. So if we count these up, uh, we have six parameters in order to fit a planet. But one of those was instrument specific and it's common to all the planets, the RV zero point. So in general, the rule is for every planet, you have five free parameters. And for every instrument that you're combining, you have one more. So six for one instrument looking at one planet. Now, a complete description of the orbit of the planet involves two more parameters, which you cannot access generally through radial velocities. One is the inclination of the orbit with respect to the plane of the sky. So I assumed an edge on orbit. If the orbit uh, is actually has some inclination, which it almost always will, especially if it doesn't transit, then you only get the component of motion uh, in your direction in K. And so everything is reduced by a factor of sine i. And the only way to figure that out is either to have a transit or to see the astrometrically what's going on, or sometimes dynamically, you can also put constraints on i. But you can't get it from the radial velocity model alone. The last one is the big omega, the longitude of the extending node. This is the orientation on the plane of the sky as if you just clocked it. Like if you took your telescope and just rotated your telescope along its barrel, you'd still get all the photons. You'd make exactly the same measurement. Um, but that's a, that's a different orientation. There's no way to access this except with astrometry or in multi-planet systems. Sometimes you can constrain the difference in big omega, but generally you need astrometry to get that. It's also sort of a nuisance parameter. It doesn't really have any um, physical significance except in multi-planet systems. <clears throat> so, these are the curves. Um, you can think of, uh, you know, once you, once you get really used to seeing these, sometimes you can just look at RVs and say, oh, that's about E of 0.6 and omega, this and that. Um, long period planets will stretch these. So P has the effect of just making them take longer. Um, changing the time of periastron passage is a phase shift. It shifts these left and right. And then um, K just stretches them vertically. So P stretches horizontal, K vertically. T naught is a phase shift, and then the other two uh, are here in this grid, and you get the other quadrants through reflections. Okay, so that's the intuition of what these things look like. How do we interpret them? So Chad went over this, um, and it's uh, I'll, and promised I would go into a little bit more detail, so here it is. You go through the math, you interpret K uh, as the half of the maximum minus the minimum of one of those curves, and it turns out this is the formula you get, and this is a problem with using old grad school slides. In my pre-recorded talk, I used the angular frequency, little omega, as 2 pi over p, which is horribly confusing because it's also longitude of periastron. So I've, I've repaired it in this version of the talk. But if you watch the pre-recorded talk, don't get thrown by that. Um, so you end up with this expression for k. Um, the, the big G period and eccentricity, those are all things you've measured. So you can put those on the left-hand side with K to get just the things you, you want to infer from your fit. And that's this quantity, n cubed sine cubed i over the sum of the masses squared. And this is what's called the mass function. Um, and it's the fundamental observable of a single line spectroscopic binary star system. Um, now, from this, we can infer the mass of the planet. But there's a couple of caveats. One is we need to know the mass of the star. 
But in general, for dwarf stars, we can get a pretty good mass, and the precision on that stellar mass is rarely the limiting uh, factor in the precision and mass of the planet. So in general, we just assume mass of the star is known. That's not always true, for instance, for giant stars. So if you know big M, you still don't know little m, because it's degenerate with i, and it's this annoying function. Um, so what we can report is the minimum mass of the planet. So if we know big I, we can set I equal to 90, assume it's edge on, and solve this cubic equation for little m. And that's called the minimum mass. So in a paper with a radial velocity measurement of the planet's mass, you are reporting the minimum mass of the planet unless you know I, in which case you can try and get the true one by solving this equation exactly. So minimum mass of the planet, that's what we learn. And the degeneracy comes from this fact that we don't know the orientation. Now, um, there's another approximation that we often make, which is to point out that the mass of the planet is usually very small compared to the mass of the star to the point where you can ignore it. If you make that approximation and you get rid of the little m in the denominator, then the one third power cancels the cube and you end up with something that's just proportional to m sine i. Uh, and just for scale, I have put down how the dependencies go here. If you have a circular orbit for a Jupiter mass planet orbiting a one solar mass star with a period of one year, that's 28.4 meters per second. And if you're thinking about Earth analogs instead of Jupiter's, you just scale things down. Earth is, uh, Jupiter is 313 um, Earth masses. So if we scale down 28.4 meters a second by a factor of 300, we get nine centimeters per second, which is the target if you're after Earth-like planets and one-year orbits around sun-like stars. Um, so uh, because of this approximation, we often simply just say that what we measure is m sine i. And for um, brevity, in many papers, you'll see instead of minimum mass, they'll just write m sine i at the top of a column, um, which is uh, a shorthand. But um, when you're actually computing the mass, you're actually computing the full minimum mass. You're not neglecting the little m in the denominator, although for very low mass planets, it makes no difference. Also, this sine i factor is not so bad. Like, you can certainly get bitten, as Dave Latham was with a face-on system now and then, but most systems are nearly edge-on. There are more ways for a system to be edge-on than pole-on, statistically. The typical magnitude of the sine i error is around 15%. So if you just inflate all of the m sine i values you see by about 15%, then you're more or less unbiased um, to the, the true distribution, the true numbers. OK, so there were a bunch of questions yesterday about how you can go about finding multiple planets in a system and what to do about it. Uh, I'm going to take some figures here from Kat Feng's undergraduate thesis with us at Penn State. Uh, where she did exactly this. So here is an old favorite of ours, GJ849. Um, this is a uh, end dwarf with two giant planets. And so you can see pretty clearly in the upper left figure here, there's a nice, you know, double sinusoid going on. Uh, and they've just added together straight up. And so uh, Kat here had three different instruments to worry about. So three different uh, zero points for two planets. So each planet has five orbital parameters. And then we have three instruments. So that's 13 orbital parameters. This is a 13 parameter fit that she made. And then once you know the orbital parameters, you can subtract off the other planet or other planets and just show the one planet that you fit, which is what she's done in the two phase plots down in the bottom. And you can see from the residuals that this is a very good fit. Um, sometimes the planets will have extremely different periods. So in this case, HD 217107b, one of the first exoplanets discovered, has a nice short period. You can see it bouncing up and down. But if you follow it for 15 years, eventually you'll see that there's another planet added on top of it that's eccentric. And so um, if you look in the lower right, you see that beautiful planetary curve. The signal to noise here is enormous. This is an easily detected planet. But it took 15 years to discover it just because we had to wait for it to go all the way around. And until it turned around, you weren't really sure what you were looking at. So it's very hard to do a fit with less than one complete orbit. My rule of thumb is you need to see three extrema before you can really be sure you've got it. OK, now, um, a lot of times we'll have a lot more than just two planets. I'm going to go to this classic paper by Deborah Fisher, 
on 55 Cancri. I'm not going to go through the whole process because there's five whole planets and we're going to spend a lot of time in the hands-on sessions learning how to do these fits. I just want to show um, uh, what happens is you peel away the onion in this paper, which is really worth reading on how to on um, uh, how to do this. So Deborah was working with this system. It turns out it has five planets. She had data from Lick and Keck Observatory. So um, five planets, two observatories, 27 orbital parameters in the final fit. You can see by eye that there's a high frequency and a low frequency component. I'm not going to go through fitting for those. Um, it's just like what Kat did earlier, but they're at 15 days and 5,200 days. When you subtract those two planets out, you can look at the residuals and you can take a periodogram. So a periodogram is like a Fourier transform for unevenly sampled data. You pick a lot of trial orbital periods, you fit sinusoids at each period, and you plot the amplitude, uh, or if it's a power, I guess, the square of the amplitude of those signals. And when you do, you see all these spikes, one of which is clearly significant. The others, uh, they kind of look like they're in the grass. Are they significant or not? That's something we can talk about later. But the 44-day signal is definitely real. Um, and when Deborah did a three-planet fit, including that signal, and subtracted it off, this is what remained. And in the paper, she goes through a lot of work justifying these spikes as being real. The 2.8-day signal, which when subtracted off, leaves the 260 day signal. And when she subtracts that off, there's no power left. An important thing to note though about this periodogram, Deborah used it um, in an exploratory way to find the planets and then did a lot of work to justify whether they were real or not. You'll note that there used to be this spike at 88 days that was taller than two of the real planets, but it turns out that's just a harmonic of the C planet. So you can't really trust periodograms. You can't just look at a spike and say, oh, that's a planet, unless it's really tall. Um, you really have to interrogate them and see what's going on. And indeed, if you look at this, um, the, the, the power on the, the, the orbital period plot stops at just, um, just, before one, just after one day. So Deborah didn't even look, none of us were looking then, for planets with periods less than one day. Uh, and it turned out that bit us because that power at 2.817 days turns out to show up again on the other side of one day in an alias. So the question was which one was real. Uh, and Becky Dawson and Dan Fabricky had this nice paper where they argued very persuasively that if you carefully look down there at the periodogram, the correct period is 0.7365 days. So if you want to know how to interpret periodograms and get this sort of stuff done, I recommend this paper. I was very skeptical of this result when it came out. I remember Dan and I got in a huge argument about it. But he and Becky were totally right, which is a good, wonderful thing, because it allowed them to get an ephemeris and uh, observe the transits. Josh Wynn observed the transits of this object, and it's a transiting planet around a V of six star. So you Periodograms can definitely fool you and you have to be careful with them. Um, everything I've talked about has been about kinematic models where you just assume the Keplerian. In truth, planets can interact with each other. And in 55 Cancri, they do. Ben Nelson has a nice paper on that. The first really good demonstration of this was by Rivera and Lissauer in the GJ876 system. This is an M dwarf with two giant planets and a two to one resonance. When you have a resonance, planets can interact very strongly. And so what you see here looks like one planet going up and down with a long period planet underneath, but that's not what's happening. What you actually have are two planets in a two to one resonance, both pretty high frequency. And what you're seeing there is the orientation of the outer planet's orbit change. Little omega is not constant. It actually goes around a full 360. It processes over the course of a decade. When we fit this kinematically, you just get completely the wrong periods. You get roughly the wrong masses, roughly the wrong, I'm sorry, roughly the right periods. Um, but you just can't account for all of this stuff going on. If you do it properly, then, then if you go in and look at those residuals, those are too high, you can pull out that in fact there is a D component uh, down close in and there's even an E component farther out, but you can only pull those out if you do a fully dynamical simulation, meaning you're doing an n-body simulation for your model and not that Keplerian model that I showed earlier. So uh, in summary, there are five orbital parameters that describe an RV curve plus one per telescope. 
periodograms are wonderful exploratory heuristic tools for identifying signals and disentangling multiple planets because they stand out cleanly in Fourier space, or this approximation of it. But they are not rigorous. They're subject to harmonics. They're subject to aliasing. You can't really trust the false alarm probabilities you infer from them. You have to do a lot more work um, and there's, we'll hear a lot more about how to do that later, I think. And finally, planet-planet interactions are sometimes important and require dynamical modeling. Okay, I'll take questions. All right, thanks very much, Jason, for a great talk. We have a load of questions already submitted here. I've been doing my best to keep track of them before they disappear because the panelists have been doing a, a great job answering them. But there's a few of them I think um, would be good to hear a live answer from you. Um, one of those is, what does the true anomaly mean in reality? Can you touch back on that yeah. again, please? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, the true anomaly, I should be able to get back to my figure pretty quickly here. It's the, it's, it, this is a real angle in the system. Um, it is how far in its orbit, angularly, the planet has traveled since the last periastron passage. So at periastron, it's zero. At apoastron, it's pi but it is that physical angle in the system. Um, the others, the mean anomaly and the eccentric anomaly, I think there might be really complicated geometric interpretations of them, but it's nothing very straightforward. Thanks, Jason. And um, related to that, there was a couple questions um, talking about the gamma. So mm -hmm. how do you measure that in practice and why is it sometimes difficult to measure? So gamma, um, so when you're measuring it as the RV offset, it's actually just a nuisance term. Um, it's just, you know, subtracting a constant from all of them. Um, I do have some slides actually on this matter of gamma. Um, this gets to the precision versus um, uh, accuracy of precise radial velocities. So in principle, you would measure gamma by saying, aha, I recognize that line in the stellar spectrum that's an iron three line at such and such a wavelength in the lab. I see where it is in the star. I look at delta lambda and I compute a velocity, but it's not that simple. And the reason is that the gas in the star is moving. It's moving fast. And more of that gas is moving towards you with respect to the center of mass of the star than away because the upwelling regions are larger and they're also brighter so you get more photons from them. This is called the convective blue shift. It's a source of RV jitter and it's variable. There's also the gravitational redshift. And then there are also issues in just translating lab wavelengths to, to wavelengths in your spectro spectrometer. So for all of those reasons, in general, our precision on, or our accuracy of RVs is of order 100 meters a second. There's this nice paper by Carly Chuback that has a lot of those listed comparing to previous work by David Neidiver and Stefan Udry. So in general, absolute RVs are known to 100 meters a second, but for planets, we don't actually care what they are at all. We just subtract them off. Thanks, Jason. And, and I would add I mean, to that there's some work from Danis Javins that on oh, these. Oh, absolutely. Absolute Danis Javins has done some wonderful work on how well we can actually measure these. Yeah, this, this is a great. Maybe topic. I can in inject a quick comment here. Um, the yeah. gamma also does double duty in a way because we also assign a gamma to each one of the spectrographs when we combine right. data, and then it is an instrument offset. That's so one right. has to keep these things separate. One describes instrument by instrument offsets, and the other one is really the physical velocity of the star. That's right. What we solve for in our models here in the hands-on workshop are purely instrumental offsets. Getting to the true gamma that a stellar astro astronomer thinks about for the true velocity of the star requires this sort of work like in this paper, for instance. And um, a very fundamental question for you here, Jason. So um, they may maybe some people got it as we run along, but just in case they didn't, um, mm -hmm. what's the physical meaning of the RV semi-amplitude? Right, the, the physical meaning of the RV semi-amplitude uh, is how fast the, the, the star was moving towards us minus at, at its maximum, minus how quickly it was moving away from us at its minimum, that is the peak to valley velocity divided by two. So physically, it's just the difference in velocities. It's the size of the velocity wobble or the magnitude of that wobble. And this is how we interpret that. And then I think we have time just for one last question quickly here. Um, there 
there was some questions about um, the, the, the M sign I and mm -hmm. what you said about how uh, most systems are edge on. Can you, can you remind us what you were oh, talking about there? Sure. Uh, the, most systems. Sort of well, a okay. fundamental limitation of, of RVs. This That's M right. So we, what we measure is the minimum mass, um, which is the mass the planet would have um, if the system were edge on and gave us exactly the signal that we see. Um, the, the, most systems are not edge on, and so the true mass of the planets we measure are almost always larger. So the question is how much larger, how far off are you um, because you don't know sine i? And the median error you make by looking at minimum masses instead of true masses is 15%. Now, if it's face on, it can be almost arbitrarily high. So there's a huge tail of, of errors out to very large masses. And in fact, Dave Latham was observing a low mass star and thought it might be, you know, but it looked like it had the mass of a giant planet. So those cases do happen. And the mean is quite large in that error, but the median is only 15%. Awesome. Thanks very much, Jason. There's a load of questions left, but we're